Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa aparuta de sangamatasa tawara e sota van ta ba mun jan tu sa tang. So this afternoon is an invitation to reflect on the way it is. <clears throat> and at this time, it's very important to change one's perspective on the world and the consciousness, because we tend to, in the Western world, Western society, and worldly attitudes are all about consciousness inside the body. The space and time are outside the body. And so we, we tend to operate from this, like just recently, India has succeeded in sending a drone to the south pole of the moon, wherever that is. But, uh, and so as we <clears throat> extend our ability to explore the universe that we see as very separate, like the moon to all of us is very far away. Technology allows us now to go to the moon. They want to see what kind of materials the moon is made of. Maybe we, we can import them to the Earth or send humans to live on the moon or Mars. And so this whole idea of the universe is out there. It's vast. And we're here in a very limited form, human form. So they perception we have through the senses, like what we see is the moon looks very far away, and uh, the shrine in the temple here is, is over there, and then there are these oak pillars around us, and the monks and nuns are all sitting here, lay people uh, contained in, this, in the same space. But space is, you know, is, as I've given many reflections on space, is we tend to see it and not give it much attention because we measure space according to the size of the room or the building or the, how far the moon is in space or the sun is in space. But space extends, where does it have an end? Where does it begin and end? Where did, where did space ever begin? At what period of time? Was there a period where space began? Or we can question this, but there's no answer to the question. We don't know. So space very much is just taken for granted, like the nun's space, the monk's space, and layman's space. So we, we give names as, as if it belonged to individuals or to properties. How many wars are around space? You know, where is the border of Ukraine and Russia? Or, and uh, the space, we see Ukraine as a certain space, in a certain space, Russia, in a different space. But space has no name or form, 
other than spaciousness. So one year I meditated on space because I became, when I was with Lung Pa Cha, and, and I uh, began to, you know, just to see what kind of nimitta or sign you get from contemplating, meditating on space. So just the visual space that, that I see through my limited vision was good enough, you know. And then the space between the monks, the space between the nuns, the space between the lay people, the right space, the left space. But at the end of the meditation, which I carried on for weeks, was just spaciousness. The space has no beginning or end. So space then, you know, then, uh, then space allows forms to manifest, allows time to. Is space, does it have a beginning or an end or a time sequence? But the forms do have beginning and end. We have civilizations, we have uh, the theories of evolution, and uh, they discover all kinds of ancient cities. And uh, before civilization, the dinosaurs and on and on were, had a beginning and an end in space. So if there wasn't any space, a million years ago, there wouldn't be dinosaurs. So where did the mountains and the oceans, when did they begin? And then we realize they're in space. The Earth is in the same space as the sun, as each one of us is in the same space as the sun Space has no ownership and no quality other than spaciousness. It's endless, immeasurable. <clears throat> so this is this, this, just this kind of reflecting on something so, so taken for granted and yet so here and now. Because wherever you are, whatever state of mind you're in, your, your body is always in space. And the body is, is a time form. It has an age. It has qualities. It's male or female. It's black or white. It's young or old. So the qualities are all about the earth, fire, water, and air elements. So that's what we are. We're these elements of earth, fire, water, air, and space. And the earth, fire, water, and air elements are all time-bound that manifest in space. So this is like an investigation of the way it is. Just by using these, these uh, teachings of the Buddha, the six elements, and it changes our perspective because modern education doesn't reflect on the way it is. It, <clears throat> you know, we try to see things in terms of a very conditioned mind, like how my mind was conditioned, it wasn't the same as yours. So conditioning is like cultural conditioning, social conditioning, it's, it's identification with forms. And the forms have qualities, male, female, right, wrong, good, bad, blue, yellow, red. And so they have qualities. And so in meditation, when we talk about nimittas or forms that appear, uh, they have colors, they have forms. 
Because that's what we're conditioned to perceive is colors and forms, sounds, loud and soft and high and low. So the forms that we identify with are a time-conditioned phenomenon. So they're very unstable and unsatisfactory. And so the human form is a, a very unsatisfactory form by its very nature. No matter how intelligent or gifted it might be in, in worldly conditions or in the arts or sciences or physics, these are unstable conditions whether we're just a ditch digger, a laborer on the road, or an astrophysicist, you know, we have to deal <clears throat> with the beautiful and the ugly and time elements and aging elements and, and emotional problems, family problems, social problems, political problems. It's endless, you know, the problems that the forms create in space. And yet we tend to operate, operate from an ideal of, of moving, always progressing towards something perfect that has qualities, form, in space. And so if we can establish a, a Human, human community on Mars, it's in the same space you're in now. You know, whether Mars is how many light years away from the Earth, the space isn't distant, it's here and now. It's not something, you know, it, in terms of our perception, it's far away. But in terms of the reality of awareness, space isn't about near or far, it's here and now. So what does that do to your mind when you change, when you see, when you start investigating the way it is? You, you know, where just identifying with the human form it can be incredibly lonely. And so they, you know, just it's so unsatisfying to just be this, this form with its senses, its age, its gender, and the way it's been conditioned by society, by conventions, even by Buddhism. Buddhism, as we get it through the scriptures, through the books and literature about it, it is still phenomenal form that manifests in space. So where does, where is space and form where they merges in consciousness. So consciousness, as I've pointed out many times in these reflective talks, is here and now. And if there was no consciousness, there'd be nothing to, where could uh, space be of any, where would even, have a word for it. There'd be no words, no language. There'd be nobody to reflect on space. So consciousness is the source of everything. We get to the very source. And that's, you know, quite a marvelous thing when you think of it, that these delicate forms can actually realize, break down 
through mindfulness and wisdom to no longer limit themselves to the forms and limitations of social conditioning and religious conditioning and, and identity with the body, with views and opinions. They all disappear. You know, they're all unstable all impermanent, that's the way it is. It's not a put down or a diminishing of anything, but it's putting things in their proper place where we can actually witness here and now the way things are, the way it is. So these teachings of the Buddha, like the Four Noble Truths, which I value very much and emphasize when I give these reflective talks is this the kind of directional signs to realize this. What is the, the third noble truth is called Naroda. What's that? The end of suffering. So, just through realizing suffering as we experience it, we're not, we're not thinking of worldwide suffering, we're not, not looking out at all the miserable things that are going on in the, on planet Earth at this time, the suffering of, of people in war zones and dying from famine. But the suffering that you feel here at Amravati. That you can't help but feel. When you're looking for uh, a monastery or a place where you're never going to suffer, you, 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 you'll never find one. Because wherever you go, you take your social conditioning your biases, your prejudices, your views, opinions, your identity with your body, with your appearance, with your gender. They go with you even to a beautiful paradisical place on planet Earth where everything is, is maybe, you know, good weather, beautiful things, good food, amenable friends, good friends, well, all the best that you can imagine. But you'll never find that because th things are, these forms are uh, unstable. Like right now in Hawaii, the island of Maui has been devastated by fire that was, wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't some kind of bomb that exploded on this very beautiful, very lovely island in the Pacific Ocean, but it was considered a paradise where people like to go for holidays. So Maui gets devastated because that's the way it is. Fires, climate change are natural phenomena. That's the way it is. Everything's changing. So what does that really, how does that affect you, that kind of language, when you reflect on it, you know, is, when you hear me talk like this, how, what's your reaction? How do you feel when, you, when I'm asking you to change your perspective from the worldly view, the self view, the separate view of me in a vast universe, to realizing consciousness, the universe, is in consciousness. Time and space are in consciousness. Or you could even say the universe is consciousness. The word universe means complete and whole. Uh, 
No, I'm not. You know, I'm suggesting, encouraging you to to start investigating this. Don't just believe what I say and repeat me. But find out for yourself, because there's a very kind of marvelous switch in how we experience life. When we take life very personally, then we're going to suffer. Because the separate person is very inadequate to, to be important, to be special, to be gifted, to, to want accolades and rewards and celebrity and power. You know, these little forms, these human forms, male or female, you know, we be, make fools of ourselves trying to be powerful and important and be celebrities and famous or win beauty contests or Nobel Peace Prizes or, you know, be considered uh, uh, somebody who, who's important in the world. When that's our goal in life, or to, to be, just to be nobody, just wanting to be nobody. Wanting to be nobody is still conceit, because it's coming from this ignorance that I'm somebody, and I don't want, I want to, I want to be in the background, I don't want fame, I don't want power, I don't want wealth. I just want peace. And what is that? That's all these kind of desires for something. So we, we create ourselves with language. There's no Ajahn Sumedho other than the, the words that, that we use. But the words are, are empty phenomena. They have no real essence or anything. So Ajahn, you know, if there are ten Vasas, everybody's called Ajahn. So that means teacher. That makes you more important than uh, Machima or middle person who hasn't reached ten Vasas. And when you reach twenty Vasas, then you're Mahatera. And that word maha means very senior. That's a very noble title, be a mahatera. So titles in the monastic life are given to us by the world. They're Pali words, bhikkhu, siladhara, they're all Pali language that we, is part of this tradition. But they're all empty phenomena you know, but then we grasp them, like, I'm senior to you, I'm an Ajahn, you're not, and I'm a bhikkhu, and you're only a siladhara, and, and you're only an anagarika, and, and we create endless self-conceited views through identifying with our position in the Sangha, when the actual reason for ordaining as samanas is to let go of everything and not be anything. So the word bhikkhu means one who's dependent on alms. So when I took British citizenship years ago, I changed my name, the name given to me by a my parents, Robert Jackman, Christian name, was baptized, and changed it to Bhikkhu Sumato, because that's, I find that the word Bhikkhu is more meaningful to me than Robert. Robert is associated with so many uh, past experiences based on social experience, conditioning, worldly experience, and when I was totally ignorant of the way it is, Robert Jackman was caught up in that whirlwind of samsara, trying to survive. 
where Biku depended on arms, for an American that is uh, quite a sacrifice because the American culture is all about being self-sufficient. You know, I don't need you. I can I can do everything by myself. But old age is uh, humbling because I remember when I went back to live in Thailand twelve years ago, and I was seventy-six when I went back, and and I, in all in Thai terms, I was an old monk and a Mahatera and a Chao Kun, a high title given by the king. <clears throat> and so all the young monks wanted to help me down the steps and, you know, they wanted to look after me and, and I kept, I didn't put these into words, but my reaction from the Robert Jackman identity was very much I can manage these steps by myself. I don't need help because that's proud. I'm a, I'm still young. I don't need a lot of young youngsters helping me because I'm still can manage these steps. So what is that? What is that in terms of the way it is? It's conceit, isn't it? Then I reflected on you know they, this is a generosity. They. They respect, uh, I'm, I've got all these titles and I'm old and I'm a Mahatera, so the, they're conditioned, socially conditioned, to respect that. So they're operating from their conditioning, which is about respecting old age, especially old samanas, old bhikkhus. And that's the way it is. It's, uh, uh, you know, in in uh, the West, old age is not respected very much. It's dreaded. It's kind of a nuisance. You have to, you know, you have to look after your old parents, and you have to kind of, you know, you put them in old people's homes, and and uh, people love to, um, you know, love babies because babies are really cute and lovable. You know, so when people bring their babies here, then we all say, oh, what are you cute, aren't you sweet? And then, but they don't do that when you're 89 years old. <laughs> because you're no longer cute or pretty or sweet. And that's the way it is. Old age is like this. And if we identify with it, then we suffer. We, because if I still identified with my appearance or people praising or admiring me or flattering me or whatever, then when I don't get that, then I suffer. I feel I'm old and worthless. Identify with, with an aging body and an aging body is nothing to identify with. It's like this. It has its problems. And, and that's the way it is. That's natural phenomena changing. It's doing it because it's a, a form in space that was born, grows up, gets old, and will die. That's the way it is. So when we use the words the way it is, it's the way it is, it's not, um, it's not a criticism in any way. It's not just a kind of resignation to fate and a kind of, well, that's the way it is, so what, kind of dismiss it. But it's a way of reflecting on the way we experience through these very unstable, very sensitive forms that we identify with. 
when these forms were created, you know, they had a beginning, they were brought, manifested into space, and space is in consciousness. Because if there is no consciousness, how could any of us be born if there was no space to be born into? So getting back to the source, conscious awareness, that's mindfulness here and now. Santitiko Dhamma, Akaliko Dhamma, apparent here and now and timeless. So in, in my own reflective abilities, you know, it's, seems so timeless. My life seems timeless. When I identify with the body, then there's a lot of time conditioning. Around. When I cling to the, the age, old age and decrepitation of the, the physical body, because you don't want it as a person. My personality doesn't want to be old and limited in vision and hearing and the senses fading and getting eye injections and walking around with a walking stick and, you know, as a, as a personality doesn't really want to, to, to have to do that because it was formed, my personality was formed when I was young and healthy. But you're not your personality. You know, and this is, what are you then if you're not a form, if you're not a person? What is your true nature? What is your original face? What is your, what is ultimately real is consciousness, which we're all experiencing here and now. So it's not something you know, you've got to get, because you can't get it as a person. You know, trying to get enlightened as a person, you can't do it. You can think you're enlightened and believe you are enlightened if you like to delude yourself. But you find out if you really investigate the way it is, the, your personality is changing. You know, you can't, you have insights, you have profound insights into the way it is. And then we attach to the memories of those insights. We want to have permanent insights. But once insight happens, you know, it, it's here and now. So it isn't like a dream or anything. But, the ten, but our habit tendency is so conditioned to go back to the personality and identity with the form. And that's how we're programmed for that. I'm programmed for identity with this body and with the views and opinions and memories that arise and, and cease. But vipassana is like an insight into the way it is. It actually means looking into the way it is. The, the four foundations of mindfulness is a helpful tool to investigate the way it is. The body, the, the feelings, memories, consciousness itself. So we, we tend to investigate what we see through, because of consciousness through the forms. So we have eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, body consciousness. We separate consciousness into the limitations of the senses that we identify with.
But how could the eyes, how could there be senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or brain, if there was no consciousness? How could a brain made out of uh, the four elements be conscious on its own? You know, it's a made out, it's a form that manifests, that had a beginning and an end. So the human brain is something that, uh, you know, functions as long as we're alive. When we're dead, it de decays like everything else, all conditioned phenomena. So when we identify as consciousness is in the body, we're limiting ourselves to suffering, experience of suffering. Because old age is suffering. Be having an old body is not pleasant kind of joyful experience if one identifies with it. Because the personality doesn't want to be old, doesn't want to be helpless, doesn't want to get eye injections, injections in your eyes with, to stop, from go, stop me from going blind. I don't want that as a person. But that's the way it is in terms of natural phenomena, which is born, must grow up, get old, and die. And this is pointed to so thoroughly by the Buddha in his scriptural teachings. And then the manifest world, because there's heaven and hell, male and female, day and night, then there's, when we identify with these forms, then we're caught in the dualistic problems that exist between the forms. Heaven is good, hell is bad. You know, just obviously we divide everything into dark, which is dangerous and frightening, and light, which is illuminating, and, and then the gender problems, male and female, and, uh, and the class problems, rich and poor, and the racial problems, black and white, and on and on like that. It goes on endlessly quibbling about equality and rights view and and, um, you know, wanting to, to make the forms perfect and make social justice, create social justice and perfect social harmony is a kind of lovely ideal. But that's not the way it is. This, this war is a natural relationship or problem with the opposites. where in conscious awareness, both exist in equally. And so male and female have the same consciousness. Things black and white arise and cease according to conditions. At night you can't see because it's dark. And that's the way it is. In daytime, sometimes the sun is so strong you can't see because it's blinding. Too much light is blinding. And that's the way it is. So light and dark are phenomenal conditions that arise and cease in consciousness. So the teaching of the Buddha is to let go of phenomena, not to get rid of it. You don't have to destroy anything because that, you can't. Things destroy themselves. The body is going to get old and get sick and die. That's, it's going to destroy itself. Civilizations arise and cease. <clears throat> So, you, you know, the, 
they flourish and then they degenerate. So I was born in 1934 when the British Empire was the world power. So I grew up with the perception of the British Empire as the world power, superpower. And then it ended. The British Empire collapsed. And then it became the American. And so the Americans are, consider themselves the dominant power in the world and, and all that. So that is, and they want to sustain that role of being the most prestigious, powerful, democratic leader in the world. But it can't do that. It's got to, you know, it's, that's not the way it is. That's the way ignorant, ignorant personal conditioning may want it to be, but it's going to change. It has to change. Planet Earth, you know, how many, uh, you know, you research the history of the Earth with meteors colliding in it and a whole kind of species of, of animals being uh, extinct. When they had form, they were born, grow up, get old and die, just like any other form. So the form, whether it's a saber-toothed tiger or a human form, young human form sitting here, you know, it's, it's a, an anti-form. It's not nothing to hold to and believe in, but to witness. And so this puru, this witnessing, Buddha position of conscious awareness is the way out of that ignorance of, of not getting bound and limited, imprisoned by your conditioning. Because when you are limited to how you've been programmed, then it's, it's endless, it's going to be suffering. And that's the first noble truth, to understand suffering. Not to try to get rid of it. Because that's coming from the self, isn't it? I want to get rid of, I don't want to suffer. I, I hope, uh, you know, that I die without any pain. You know, I like uh, being a monk for so long. I'd like to just go to sleep and pass away peacefully. And uh, that's how, you, you know, as a person one would like that, but who knows what, what way, what's going to happen because the future is unknown, and that's the way it is. But when you know who you are, really, then there's nothing to fear. The changes that we experience through these forms, we can, t we can adapt to, we can make the best of because they're teaching us that we're not these limited forms. You're not what you think. You're not what you believe. You're nothing. You're no thing. You're not a thing. You're not a phenomenon that's limited and bound to be born and die. So when we talk about the deathless, the door to the deathless, the gate to the deathless is open. This is it, it's this conscious awareness, the way it is here and now. It can only be like this. So if I ask you to say, what is the way it is right now? You, you know, you can look outward and think, well, it's a, uh, Dhamma talk by Ajahn Sumedho, or that's not wrong or false. But how is it, how, what, you know, when you 
just the way it is right now, the experience you're having when you're looking inward. You're not looking at me anymore, but you're looking inward, open eye dhamma. You're not looking for verification or approval from without anymore or getting caught up in criticism of the way, uh, criticizing the way it is, but just noticing. It can only be like this at this moment because in a few minutes everything's going to change. What we see is going to change. It's going to be like these bodies move through space. I go back to my kuti in the future. And that's the way it is. So I offer this as a reflection for today.